Up until this point in time, trap cards haven't really gotten too much attention, with the focus of the early sets on monsters, and then Magic Ruler was focused on spells. But now, maybe it's finally time for trap cards to shine. Huh? Who's that? <laughs> Trap cards? <laughs> They'll never be worth anything. It's... It's you. It's I. James I. Welcome to the History of Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Fox here, and in this episode, I will cover the era from October to December of 2002, and with that, we will finally be able to go through all of 2002. As always, we begin our discussion of this era with the new sets that were available. And this time around, there is only one major booster set alongside a smaller tournament pack. On October 1st, 2002, Tournament Pack Second Season was released. To be honest, this was a pretty lackluster set. That's all I really have to say. We'll take a look at the cards in it later on in the episode, but I'm sure you guys will agree with me about its minimal impact on the game. So far, it looks like to me that the tournament packs were basically a cop-out early on just used to transfer OCG cards into the TCG. They were basically prize packs that were passed out only from tournaments, hence the name they have, and that's why the cards in them that were actually good, like Mechanical Chaser in Tournament Pack 1, were extremely expensive. I remember Mechanical Chaser hitting the $60 to $70 mark, but anyways, I'm digressing way, way off topic. Back on topic, we have our main booster set. On October 20th, 2002, Pharaoh's Servant was released. Pharaoh's Servant was actually a decent set overall, and it had several cards that would significantly impact the game, but it was not as format warping in the way that its predecessors were. There isn't too much to talk about the set as a whole, so let's move on from here. The October 2002 ban list was the third ban list in the entire game, and it added cards mainly for Magic Ruler. It also was the first list to specify that Japanese, Asian English, and counterfeit cards were illegal for play. So I guess they weren't illegal before apparently, and that means I missed out on not abusing these two bad boys more. Anyways. Once again, as in the other videos, we will only be going over the changes to the ban list since the July 2002 ban list. For the forbidden cards, there is still nothing. Actually, I technically made an error in calling the list the forbidden and limited list because as of this point in time, it was technically just the limited list with the forbidden part of the list coming in much later, around two years later. For our limited section, we have Cyberjar, Confiscation, Delinquent Duo, Painful Choice, Snatch Steel, The Forceful Sentry, and Upstart Goblin. So the limited list is fairly self-explanatory overall, with the three hand control cards getting cut down to size here. I'd wager that if these cards were released in our current era though, they would likely have gone straight to zero. It's because at this point in time though, Konami was still early in the game design process, and I guess they hadn't even considered the concept of creating the Forbidden list as I kind of mentioned before. So they just limited these cards. There is the odd hit of Upstart Goblin though. This never really made sense to me. It was probably due to some OCG meta going on at the time, though I'm not too sure. The OCG at the time was a pretty mysterious entity anyways, much more so than today. And then for our semi-limited cards, we have nothing. Now let's move on to talk about the staples, starting with the staples from Tournament Pack Second Season. I mentioned before that this was a lackluster set overall, and as a result, there's literally only one notable card to look at, and that's Morphing Jar. This was the only card that was actually good from Tournament Pack Second Season, and while it didn't really have a major impact right away on the metagame, it did open up the path for some interesting strategies in the future, most notably Mill. But even outside of Mill, this was a time when flip effects were actually considered pretty good and they weren't too slow to be competitive in the metagame. And so that allowed it to be used in decks as a pseudo draw engine for decks that needed it. That basically wraps up Tournament Pack second season. Now we move on to the staples from Pharaoh's Servant, the main booster set. We start with the main man himself, Jinzo, the cover card of the set. Jinzo was printed as a secret rare and as a result he was very very difficult to get. But Jinzo was very rewarding if you did have one. Jinzo was the answer to all of the back row at the time 
and while Summon Skull still had a tad more muscle than Jinzo, he made up for it with his effect that not only gave him self protection, but it gave blanket protection to all of your monsters as well, at the cost of locking out your own trap course. Jinzo was immune to the still widely used trap hole, as well as the ubiquitous mirror force, which often made him a better option than Summon Skull in most cases because your investment would have been protected. Not only that, but more importantly, he was one of the counters to the crux control card of the format, namely Imperial Order. Jinzo was one of the few ways to get your spells back online against an imposing Imperial Order, and as a result, this format was basically a showdown of Jinzo versus Imperial Order. Our next monster is Goblin Attack Force. Goblin Attack Force was the strongest level 4 monster in the entire game at the time, nearly rivaling the tribute powerhouses of Jinzo and Summon Skull with its 2300 attack. As this card was printed a rare, it saw widespread use in many many decks, mainly aggressive beatdown strategies, as it could essentially overwhelm all other non-tribute cards. With that we move on to the spells, starting with Nobleman of Crossout. This card was the singular counter to flip effects, and it had finally come in Feral Servant. While Tribute to the Doom did a similar job, the power creep was real with Nobleman of Crossout, as it essentially did the same thing although it was much better and it did it hit for free. While Nobleman of Crossout wasn't the sole reason for the extinction of flip effects all the way until the arrival of Shadals basically, Nobleman provided such a good counter to flip effects that it would gain notorious use especially in the future GOAT format, where flip effects were still heavily used. Moving on, we have Premature Burial. I don't even know where to begin on this card. This card was very powerful at this time and it's only gotten stronger and stronger with time. I can't help but think of Bryanac zombie loops whenever I see this card, and I shudder at what decks like Teller Knights could do with Burial and Triver looping. But that's not why we're talking about Premature Burial now. Even in this format, Burial was incredibly powerful, only outclassed because Monster Reborn was still legal. But even with Monster Reborn, there is no reason not to run this card, especially when you could revive monsters like Jinzo. Next we have Limiter Removal. This card could be used with the already powerful Mechanical Chaser to give you essentially a 3700 attack beater, making it unrivaled by anything in the game at the time. Even now, this level of attack power is still monstrous, and to have this card at 3 would be a breeding ground for problems in the future. While its usage was niche at best, the synergy with Mechanical Chaser was still amazing. Remember that Mechanical Chaser was still the singular most powerful vanilla monster in the game at the time as Gemini Elf was still not released in the TCG yet, and it would not be released until Legacy of Nightmare. Although this combo with Mechanical Chaser was not that problematic, as the Mechanical Chaser came out in a tournament pack, and thus it was pretty expensive and difficult to acquire, so not a lot of people were running like Mechanical Chaser OTK decks, but Limited Removal still comboed with another powerful card that I mentioned before, and that's Jinzo. So that's two powerful cards that combos with limited removal, and that definitely makes for some big problems. And that's all we have for the spell cards. Now we move on to the trap cards. And of course, I start with the monster trap of this format, Imperial Order. I can't believe that I'm saying this, but I am so glad that Imperial Order was printed as a secret rare. I don't know how anyone played games at this time with this card around. Imagine if this card had been a common. I have no doubt that everyone would be packing three of these, and no one would get to play any spell cards at all. This card had a tremendous impact on the game in shifting tempo, locking down counterplays from your opponent, and so on and so forth. It also did this with a built-in off button for you, so that it wouldn't lock you out on your own turn. You could just essentially use it and lock out your opponent, and then turn it off on your turn, and then you could be able to use all your spell cards again. This was especially insane because all of the power spell cards at the time were still essentially legal in the game. I would say that spells were obviously the most powerful cards still at this point in time, and to be able to shut them all down with a single card was absolutely broken. I can go on and on about the impact of Imperial Order, but it basically made the game very unfun, especially at 3. Many of you guys haven't played this format and haven't played with Imperial Order around even at 1, but you can imagine how unfun it is. Then we have Ceasefire. You guys are probably thinking that Ceasefire is just another bone thrown to those obscure burn players, and yes, you would be right, but Ceasefire did much more than that. It was a better burn card than just Desserts, 
but it also had a secondary effect that was actually very important at this time. It made it a good side card because it could cancel out flip effects. You could use it and then cancel out essentially any monsters that your opponent had set to try to activate their flip effects and essentially deactivate monsters like Maneater Bug and avoid him blowing up your own monsters. So Ceasefire made a very viable main deck or side deck counter to flip effect heavy decks. Then we have Magic Crane. This is a slightly better replacement for Magic Jammer in my opinion, although some can consider it worse since the negation isn't a guarantee. At the very least, it forces a 1 for 1 from your opponent just to respond to it, which potentially forces the discard of a powerful spell card. Spell negation was and still is very rare in the game, and Magic Drain was one of the few cards at the time that offered you that power, obviously outside of Imperial Order. While Drain was easily far worse than Imperial Order, it technically had much more widespread use because it was much easier to obtain because it was only a rare. Its costless nature made it more appealing to use over Magic Jammer as well. Our next trap card is Dust Tornado. Dust Tornado was actually a very important card, especially in this format, because spell and trap removal, while it was abundant because Heavy Storm was semi-limited and Mystical Space Typhoon was still available at 3, none of these could counter Imperial Order. And so Dust Tornado was able to fill the role of countering Imperial Order, and that's why it was very important to be either used in the main deck or used in the side deck, as it was the only sort of quick play response that you had available to Imperial Order. Then we have Call of the Haunted. Call of the Haunted wouldn't have been very important if not for Imperial Order. You guys can see a theme around here. Basically, Imperial Order counters the spells, so then you have trap versions that do basically the same things as your spell cards, but they're not countered by Imperial Order. So a lot of people chose to run Call of the Haunted, maybe over Premature Burial, just to avoid being countered with Imperial Order. And this was a fairly good card as well too. Even though it was slower than Premature Burial and Monster Reborn, the fact that it was essentially was uncounterable made it a desirable choice. Especially since the negative drawback of Call of the Haunted didn't affect the main monster that you wanted to bring back from the grave anyways. And that monster was obviously Jinzo. Our last trap card didn't really have that much of a meta impact, but I'd like to mention it anyway just because one, it was in the show, and two, I remember seeing it a lot at casual locals, and that card is Mirror Wall. Mirror Wall obviously was wrecked by the meta that was run by Jinzo, but outside of Jinzo, Mirror Wall still allowed you to play around a lot of other beaters, and you could run different kinds of decks. You could run a sort of hand control using Mirror Wall to weaken your opponent's monsters, and have monsters like White Magical Hat run them over, and then you could run hand control that way. Mirror Wall, despite having little meta impact, open many opportunities for creative deck building. That's pretty much it for all the staple cards. Now I'd like to just quickly mention some notable cards, starting with Mystical Sheep number one. This card was notable because it was the first fusion substitute monster. Then we have Buster Blader, you can't forget Buster Blader. Thousand Eyes Restrict. This card would come back with a Vengeance in Go Control format. Then we have Cold Wave, which would be forgotten almost entirely until Gladiator Beast became a thing. DNA Surgery, which turned out to be a pretty good side card in some future formats. And then we have Appropriate and Gravity Bind. Last but not least, the best part of the episode, the Matter Decks. The Matter Decks did not really change too drastically with the release of Pharaoh's Servant, although there are a couple major changes that people did to their decks from the previous format. In essence, their decks were just the carbon copy of what they had from the previous deck, with some tech choices swapped out to encompass the best of what came from Pharaoh's Servant. The biggest change was essentially the replacement of Summon Skull with Jinzo for those fortunate enough to have owned him, and obviously Imperial Order was ran in threes for those who had it. Summon Skull be essentially became Jinzo Lockdown, and with the plethora of revival cards like Call of the Haunted, Premature Burial, and obviously not forgetting to mention Monster Reborn of course, Jinzo rarely left the field for long. I have an example build here of what I think the most optimal Jinzo control build would be. But of course there are numerous tech options that you had available. The variety of decks continued in small tournaments, but Jinzo and Imperial Order were what were the de facto definers of good decks in this format. Here I choose to run Premature Burials over Call of the Haunted just for speed, even though I know that Imperial Order counters them. And then instead of running Summon Skull, I run Maneater Bug and Soul Exchange just to 
counter other decks that might still be using Summon Skull. While Summon Skull was being phased out at this time, Summon Skull was still an out to Jinzo, and so you needed to be able to respond to Summon Skull somehow. Obvious answers to Summon Skull were still the staples of Dark Hole and Raigeki, but you had Man Eater Bug and things like Soul Exchange as well. Soul Exchange was additionally a very good card because it answered an opponent's Jinzo too. As I mentioned before, what defined the meta was essentially Jinzo and Imperial Order. So all the decks were basically just these two cards centrally with other main deck staples around them. There was little room for variation because these two cards were just so powerful and meta defining. I have a different example deck here which was clearly not run at all but it was entirely possible in this format to run a OTK style deck using limiter removal. I also used Guardian of the Throne Room which is a really random card but it had the strongest attack for a level 4 machine type monster so obviously I used that to combo with limiter removal. The release of limiter removal planted the seed for OTK based decks as most of the main staple monsters at this time were machine type. Jinzo and Mechanical Chaser for example both benefited from limiter and this was an insidious synergy just waiting to pounce on unsuspecting duelists as Jinzo could jump up to 4800 attack or even over the 9000 attack mark, hitting 9600 attack in a matter of seconds. And with Mirror Force being basically the only answer to attacks at the time, Jinzo had it good. You know, with the whole being immune to traps thing, yeah. With that, I would like to conclude our discussion of the metagame from October to December of 2002. And that finally brings us to the end of 2002. The next time we meet, we'll be into 2003 the year of the first Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship. If you guys made it all the way here to the end, I assume you enjoyed the video. If that's the case, please leave a comment below and give this video a thumbs up so that I know to make more.